So in my previous video on poise, I made a mistake. It turns out that we might have to rescind some trophies for the tankiest enemies, since I overlooked something that affects the poise of four different enemies in the game. Something I've seen referred to as effective poise. But since that's a bit of a rabbit hole to go down, I'm going to save that for the end of the video and start off with some rapid fire questions and answers, in a segment I'd like to call answering 20 questions about poise, because 45 minutes wasn't remotely enough to actually cover everything. But if for some reason you haven't seen the previous video, this is a follow up to that. So you might want to start there if you want the overview of how poise works. Here we're jumping right into the deep end. Chiz asks, what's the poise damage of common throwable items like throwing knives? I feel like a cool strategy would be to throw throwing knives or pots when the enemy gets away from you to reset their poise recovery timer. Yeah, this does work and it's a great use of consumable weapons. None of them do a significant amount of poise damage for PvE, but getting a hidden of almost any kind is a great way to make sure an enemy doesn't have their poise start refilling. Daggers, bone darts, poison bone darts, and crystal darts all do one poise damage. Fan daggers do half a point per projectile, resulting in two and a half poise damage if all five hit. And ultimately, the Kukri does three poise damage, the highest of the throwing knives. And bear in mind the status effects don't have any poise damage, so when bleed triggers from Kukri, or poison triggers from the poison bone darts, that's not relevant here. Now, I realize people probably aren't wondering about the pot items as much, since they're slower and you can't throw them as far, but they're actually a pretty mixed bag. A lot of them don't do any poise damage, and when an attack doesn't do any poise damage, it'll also fail to reset the timer. Now, you might be thinking that it's going to be the obvious pots that do normal damage that work, and the weirder status effect pots that don't work, and you'd be mostly correct. Uh, for example, a fire pot deals 3 poise damage, while a sleep pot does 0. That's a fair way to summarize what's going on with most of the pots, but there's weird exceptions. The volcano pot doesn't do any poise damage, neither from the initial impact nor the lingering ticks of fire damage. And the roped poison and roped feeded pots both do 3 poise damage, while their non-roped equivalents don't do any. These inconsistencies seem like an oversight. Anyways, I tested all of the consumable weapons for their poise damage, and I'll put up a big list on the screen here. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like a closer look. On to our next question. Fulltime Slacker the second asks, Do reposts and backstabs do poise damage? I hit like 10 on a Crystallion and didn't bust their armor. That's a good question, and nope, they do not. Critical attacks don't do any poise damage. And because they don't do any poise damage, they also fail to reset the timer. So if you repost an enemy whose poise was partially drained, it might refill because of the extra time spent between regular attacks. Not that that's much of a problem, since the whole point of stance breaking is that it often leads to giving you the opening for a critical attack. So if you've just landed one, it's not like the game owes you an easy stance break shortly after. For a third question, Gog the Caveman said, I didn't see you talk about the giant land octopuses in the video, but I've been killing them by stunlocking them with charged R2s for like forever, and I've no idea why it works on them specifically. Yeah, so the land octopus has 65 poise by default, but its face takes double poise damage. So anything that does at least 32.5 poise damage normally will drain all of it and break their stance in a single hit. Of course, there are heavier weapons with charged attacks that have no problem doing this, but a lot of what I refer to as medium-sized weapons, that is straight swords, katanas, spears, axes, etc., they're all capable of doing this in a single hit as well. As long as you two-hand your weapon, these charged attacks deal 33 poise damage by default, turning into 66 for the octopus. It appears that the developers were experimenting with making their effective poise higher, so it seems likely that they noticed how easy it was to do this and considered making it harder. But like I said earlier, I'll talk more about the whole effective poise thing at the end of the video. Scully asks, I wonder if being able to see these values means people can mod in a posture bar like in Sekiro. Yeah, I don't see any reason this can exist. I'm not aware of any standalone mods at the moment, but for my video I've been using the Hexington Cheat Engine table, which has an option under other scripts called Display Target Status. You can toggle a bunch of different things to display while you're locked onto an enemy. This is also how I showed enemy resistances in my Resistance Correction video. Which is my poorest performing Elden Ring dissected thus far, but I think it's an interesting mechanic, so maybe consider giving that a watch if you haven't yet. It explains why it gets harder to bleed the same enemy repeatedly. Oh, and uh, this should go without saying, but you should only use this sort of thing at your own discretion. You can get banned from online play for messing with your game with Cheat Engine, so I just want to make that clear. I don't want someone thinking that getting this poise meter to display is risk-free just because I plugged it here. 
I play offline on PC, and even if I were to go online, the risk of getting banned really isn't of personal concern to me, since I do normal playthroughs on a different platform entirely. Uh, if you can't say the same, then you might not want to use Cheat Dungeon. Jamie or Fisher asks, what about jump attacks? Don't they drain poise at a higher rate than regular attacks? And Connor Bowlby asks, does the Claw Talisman improve jump attack poise damage? To answer that second question first, the description for the Claw Talisman vaguely states that it enhances jump attacks, but unfortunately, it has no effect on poise damage. I think I would have liked for there to have been at least a small increase. And, yeah, so I sort of glossed over a lot of the attacks that I saw as being in the middle of the road. They don't provide as much poise damage as charged attacks and guard counters, so I figured people could just look up any specific attacks I didn't mention in the spreadsheet. But I realize now it was probably still important to address, since there's the expectation that they have good poise damage, and that's only kinda half true. Here's a few attacks from a typical straight sword put into a bar graph to help give an idea of what's going on. One-handed R1s do 5 poise damage, while a light one-handed jump attack only does 7.5 poise damage, so it's a bit better, but not by much. But a one-handed jumping R2 attack jumps up to 20 poise damage. Of course, that's still outclassed by the charged attacks and guard counters, but considering how a jump attack is sometimes easier to pull off, it's still one of your better options. The main thing to take away from jump attacks is that you shouldn't expect your light jump attacks to make much of a difference. It's the heavy or R2 jump attacks that have decent poise damage. So here I'm going to lump together three different questions about power stancing. Handsome asks, what about power stancing? Does it just count as if you were attacking with two weapons at once, or is there some sort of poise reduction? Fujunki asks if a power stancing jump attack is better than a two-handed R2 jump attack. And Michael Smith asks, does power stancing give you any kind of hyper armor? If I power stance two greatswords, is that the equivalent of using a greatsword two-handed? So there is a significant reduction in poise damage to each individual attack, so you're not going to get double poise damage out of power stancing. That's not to say that there's no increase, but it just kind of varies from weapon class to weapon class. The exact damage, once again, can be found in the spreadsheet, but a quick comparison can be a bit tricky since they're turned into multi-hit attacks and you have to add them together. But once they're all added together, a lot of weapon classes have their L1 power stance attacks perform in roughly the ballpark of doing 20% more poise damage than the one-handed R1 equivalents. It's a small increase, not a very big one. As far as jump attacks go, it's not really consistent when a two-handed R2 jump attack drains more poise, or if a power stanced L1 jump attack drains more poise. So here's a list of the different weapon classes and which category they fall into. But overall we can say it's the heavier weapon classes where power stancing is better. Regarding hyper armor, Unfortunately, power stancing doesn't count as two-handing, so it won't grant hyper armor for all of the great weapon classes. You can see how that only works properly when two-handing. However, colossal swords and colossal weapons do grant hyper armor on their one-handed attacks, so that does kick in for power stancing. But I should note that the hyper armor bonuses are all the same for colossal weapons, regardless if you're one-handing, two-handing, or power stancing as well. Our next question comes from Kimball Belliston. They ask, how are golems with armored legs affected? Oof, yeah, so if you remember from the previous video, I talked about how the golem's 120 poise is effectively really only 60, due to their legs taking double poise damage, and that's where most players are gonna hit them anyways. I have to admit, I kinda screwed up and sorta forgot about the tougher golems who don't have those weak spots on their legs. It's easy to tell the difference, uh, you won't see the glowing stuff there. As you might have guessed, these aren't treated as weak spots and their 120 poise functions normally, making them twice as hard to take down. Also, here's a fun fact. The weak spots shown on the golem's wrists also take double poise damage, uh, but good luck hitting those intentionally. It's also possible to whiff attacks against the weaker golem's legs and not get the double poise damage. If you do an attack that hits low and scrapes against the ground, it's possible to hit their foot instead of their leg. This next one's not really a question, but I wanted to respond to an observation from Pendantorific. This relates to the discussion on poise iframes and how I talked about not attacking an enemy like a rune bear while they're standing back up, since they won't take poise damage during that time. They notice that you can drain the poise of the golems while they're standing back up, making it easy to stunlock them. So this is only true depending on if you land the critical attack, and that's actually the deciding factor for most enemies. 
If you don't land a critical attack, hitting an enemy while they're standing back up doesn't let you chip away at their poise early. Or at least, that's the case for a lot of enemies, including the golems, and I can show a few examples on screen here. But when you do land your critical, enemies tend to recover from that a lot faster. They might have a small iframe window immediately after, like an actual iframe window against all damage and not just poise damage, but generally speaking, you can attack pretty quickly after landing a critical, and all damage, including poise damage, will be available. The golems just happen to have a longer standing up animation than most enemies when recovering from a critical attack, so there is a pretty significant window where you can chip away at it and work towards the next stance break. Reality Vanguard asks, does roll damage from the Briar armor set prevent poise recovery? Unfortunately, it doesn't do any poise damage and it won't reset the timer. But when I responded saying this, Reality Vanguard rightly pointed out that on rare occasions, they've been able to break Millennia's stance with it. So what's going on there? I wondered if this was maybe a negative poise situation and it turns out that's exactly it. So something I didn't mention in the previous video is that on rare occasions, I've seen poise go into the negative without a reaction from the enemy like their stance doesn't break when it should. I saw it happen with a land octopus once, but I had a hard time recreating it and didn't think much of it. Well, it turns out there are some enemies where the negative poise phenomena is a lot more common. I'll be talking about the abductor virgins more later on for other reasons, but it's incredibly common for them, almost guaranteed. Now, once they go into negative poise, all you have to do is get one more hidden to break it. And apparently, attacks that don't do any poise damage normally, like rolling with the briar armor, or even a sleep pot, becomes viable. But while we're talking about her, I'd like to respond to another comment from BD Brian. This one being more of a correction than a question. Millennia doesn't have poise iframes. Rather, she has poise break immunity during all of her hyper armor. You're still dealing poise damage, but she doesn't open up for a critical hit, even if it reaches or goes below zero. Yeah, and this seems to get at the heart of the real issue with Millennia. It's not really a poise iframe situation like I thought it was, and the times I failed to do any poise damage might have been caused by her just blocking my hits. So the real issue is that, like the Abductor Virgins, the poise actually drains and she often just refuses to react to it. But it's actually even worse than it is for the Abductors, because instead of lingering at zero or negative poise, it starts refilling instantly when this happens. So yeah, that's weird. At least the abductors have the courtesy to have their timer still work normally when it goes into the negative, giving you plenty of time to break their stance. Inconsistent poise mechanics actually wind up being a pretty big factor in Millennia's design. Otherwise, we'd be breaking her stance a lot more often. Janice Vesta asks, wouldn't negative hyper armor be hypo armor? For question 12 here, Smug Looking Barrel said, Summoning inside the boss fog doesn't increase a boss's health, which is why a lot of people summon Alexander for the Fire Giant. Does it also not decrease the poise damage you deal? It doesn't. NPCs summoned inside a boss arena won't affect a boss's stats, including the poise damage they take. So you can summon as many NPCs as you want for Adon, and he won't become tankier. Sniper Comrade asks, Do you have data regarding the poise multiplier enemies receive in subsequent playthroughs? On New Game Plus 7, enemies seem to have a much higher poise compared to New Game. Yes, it looks like this. Rather than directly increasing their poise, it decreases the poise damage they take. The interesting part is that there's no decrease to poise damage taken between your first playthrough and New Game Plus. But in New Game Plus 2, it drops to 95%. New Game Plus 3 drops it to 90%. Then it goes down to 85%, then 80%. Then with New Game Plus 6, it takes a bigger leap down to 70%. Then ultimately it caps at 60% poise damage taken in New Game Plus 7. Note that this debuff to poise damage only applies to PvE poise. Toughness, or PvP poise, is unaffected, so regular NPCs won't become tankier. Bathynemius asks, how does it work with parries? As some enemies need three parries to get into the repostable state, it gives the same sound cue, so does it drain this invisible bar as well, or a separate one? So nope, this doesn't use poise. Although, I don't know what it uses. I assumed this was going to be handled via special effects, like something running in the background that says, if a parry happens, it's not going to fully work. 
But then once you do that, it would switch over to running a new command that says the next parry will fully allow a repost. But I couldn't find anything like this in the special effects. Although me not finding anything doesn't really mean much, but I know smarter data miners who haven't been able to pinpoint this either. If you know more about how this is programmed, please leave a comment below. The same thing goes for the Royal Revenants, having their stance broken by a cast of heal. This also seems to be operating outside of poise. I can at least say that the heal spells themselves don't do any poise damage under normal circumstances, that's set to zero. And you can't see their poise meter drain when you cast it. But beyond that, I'm not totally sure what's happening behind the scenes. Question 15 comes from Nuffly893. They said, I would like to know further information about the ornamental straight swords. That different R2 doesn't seem to be covered in the spreadsheet. At first, I thought this was going to be covered in the spreadsheet. You can find Golden Tampering in the Ashes of War attack data tab, and so I thought these were going to be all of the multipliers for each stage of its attack. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what this actually is either, since this is not how it plays out. After some testing, here's what I found. If you can manage to land every single stage of attack on an enemy with the charged R2, it'll drain 20 poise total. And to break that down, that's 1 poise damage from every initial hit, of which there are 10 and then another 10 poise damage from the final, bigger hit. And the regular R2 just does that final stage of attack for 10 poise damage. Considering how a one-handed charged R2 from any other straight sword, or even this straight sword if we don't use the weapon art, does 30 poise damage, 20 from Golden Tempering is a bit disappointing. Henrik Dodwell asks, In the next video, could you mention Ash of War Cragblade? It also increases poise damage. Sure, so the initial Crackblade attack itself can do the most poise damage when paired with certain colossal weapons, like the Prelate's Inferno Crozier. This is because the first stage of attack wants to multiply 1.5 against your weapon's base poise damage, and the second stage wants to multiply by just 1. So with a base poise damage of 7 from this weapon, that gives us a total of 17.5 poise damage. But after you do that attack, you also have that lingering effect from this Ash of War, which is what you're really asking about, and that buffs poise damage by 10%. The Golem's Halberd seems to be the hardest hitting class of weapon that can actually be paired with it, giving it a two-handed charged R2 that's on par with most colossal swords, hammers, and flails. So in other words, this actually can't really be paired with the heaviest hitting weapons, but it's not bad. What is normally 39.6 poise damage can be turned into 43.56 poise damage. This is up there but it's still not as high as the Great Club's two-handed charged R2, so it's not helping us break any records. But if there's DLC in the future with newer weapons that have higher poise damage that allow this Ash of War, that could be subject to change. Question 17. Chris Zuski asks, Never broke the Red Wolves' stance. Do they have a visceral animation? I'm actually really thankful you asked this because my first thought was, yeah. I've seen them present that orange glowing orb that tells you a critical attack is available. But now I realize that I've never actually landed that critical. In normal gameplay, I probably assumed I just wasn't fast enough and missed it. But no matter how hard you try, it's just not possible, apparently. I ran this by King Boar, and he found that they, in fact, don't have any throw param entries. So yeah, it doesn't work because it's essentially not turned on. They should either patch this so it works, or remove the glowing orb. I'd prefer the former, but either would be preferable to how it is now. It's very misleading. At number 18 here, Fernando Jr. asks, what's the poise damage of those freaking dragonflies? It's 50, just like the standard attacks of most lesser mobs. So you'll need 51 to withstand it, which feels a bit high. Jurassic Kratos and several others asked about which enemy does 70 poise damage to the player. If you remember from the previous video, there was one outlier in the entire game from enemy attacks that did something between 50 and 100 poise damage. This value right here. And as it turns out, this belongs to an unused attack animation from the Kaiden Cell Swords. So at the end of the day, it's not really in the game. This really cements the idea that 51 and 101 poise are the only breakpoints that matter for PvE. There's no point in bothering with anything in between. And finally, I wanted to address a sort of broader question, or even argument, that several people had. But I'll introduce it via Paco Libre's question, which was, Do enemies have a PvP poise that determines when they flinch? as opposed to the critical knockdown? The short answer is no, or maybe, sort of. But this doesn't operate under traditional poise. When I'm able to push an enemy in PvE around, it's not operating under the same rules as toughness, and there's no actual numbers to be drained. A different system is being used entirely. Now, since we've traditionally defined poise as when we're able to push an enemy around, I can understand if some might prefer to think of this as yet another 
third poise mechanic that I only hinted at in the previous video, but it's also helpful to understand why it's fundamentally different. I even got several comments complaining that I was conflating stance with poise, but just to be clear, stance is poise. It's not something different, it exists because of poise. So let's take a step back and take a broader look at the terminology, then I'll get back to the question. Behind the scenes, Stance uses a system referred to in the data as Super Armor. This is actually the exact same poise system that was used in Dark Souls 1. It's been modified slightly since then, but you can think of enemies in Elden Ring as having Dark Souls 1 poise, with the only key difference being that critical attacks are often allowed after draining that poise. Just imagine that an enemy in Dark Souls 1 gets immediately parried after breaking their poise, and that's barely even a metaphor for what's happening in Elden Ring. That's closer to literally what's happening. Meanwhile, PvP Poise uses a new mechanic that behind the scenes is known as Toughness. Now you might be saying, Stance has never actually called Poise an Elden Ring, while we do see Toughness referred to as Poise. So really, Toughness is the new Poise, and just because Stance is built off of the older Poise system, that doesn't mean we still have to call it that. But here's the thing, Stance and Toughness both share the same Poise damage. They both drain like Poise using traditional Poise damage values, and the two mechanics are inseparable in this way. For example, the Stone Barb Cracked here talks about improving your damage to enemy stance, and doesn't say anything about poise damage. But it does increase your poise damage in PvP, because stance damage and poise damage are the exact same thing. The only differences are what happens depending on who's on the receiving end, with stance breaks being a PvE only thing, and PvP poise having minor staggers instead, with a different regeneration system. I realize this is all very convoluted, and you might disagree with me referring to stance as PvE poise, but bear in mind that I didn't make the poise meter shown here, so whoever made this for the Hexington Cheat Engine table also saw it that way. I also didn't make the spreadsheet that referred to stance damage as PvE poise damage either, though I was already independently thinking of it that way. So if you're on the side that was really adamant that stance shouldn't be called poise, just bear in mind that's probably a losing battle since it seems like a lot of people already agree that it's a form of poise, you just have to specify which. And in fact, it's built directly off of the oldest form of poise these games have. Okay, so to stop being on the defensive here and actually get back to the question, what the hell else is going on in PvE that allows you to make enemies flinch? The way this works is it's using something called the damage level system. I'm not sure if the community will rally around a better name because damage level is incredibly vague and from the name alone, you'd probably expect it to be about something else. I've been calling it stun damage level to help clarify things, but in the same way we don't name all of the mechanics after what they're called internally, a commenter named Javi proposed calling it impact. And um, I'll have to let that idea stew for a bit, but I think I like it. I'll likely make a future video about this because I haven't really done the deep dive myself yet, but the super quick explanation is that it's built around a number check, rather than actually draining a meter. This is why a one-handed R1 from a short sword never stuns this banished knight, at least not without draining its poise for a full stance break. I can just keep attacking over and over, but we're not going to see that minor stagger. But it only takes one one-handed R2, because the damage level increases from 1 to 2, eliciting a different response from the enemy. It gets pretty complicated, because the defense levels aren't an easy thing to look up that correspond to our damage level attack values in a clear way. The Banished Knight has most of its value set to 4, so something in this field here is telling it that a damage attack value of 2 is able to get through. The 4 here has more like an accompanying set of instructions on what works. It's not just a matter of this number being higher or lower than the number 2, but at the end of the day, it's still just a number check. So again, if you prefer to think of this as a component of poise, that's perfectly fine, but it also just works very very differently, and that might have to be its own full episode in the future. I know a lot of people wanted to know more about it, so hopefully the summary gives you a better ballpark understanding for the time being. Before we close out this video with effective poise, I did want to quickly touch upon some more weirdness with the hyper armor system. Getting some negative hyper armor from great weapons was a bit of shock to some viewers, and that's probably the most noticeable and severe quirk of hyper armor. But I spoke with AE, one of the creators of the hyper armor calculator, had some more feedback about its weirdness. He said, if you didn't have full poise health prior to performing a melee attack, you will not have the maximum possible hyper armor, but instead 80% of that maximum for most attacks, unless the bonus exceeds that 80% to begin with. Which when combined with how armor poise penalizes the hyper armor bonus, 
has the roundabout and exceedingly cursed effect of making increases to poise actually detrimental within a certain range. If you perform a crouch attack with a colossal sword against an enemy with a godskin stitcher one-handed R1, and you started with low poise health, you can take it if your armor poise is above 21, or below 6. Wow, that's right, so apparently there are scenarios for trading hits where your poise can't be between a certain amount. It would have to be high or low enough to take a hit, and there's like a dead zone in the middle. That's... yeah. I had no idea about that, and that's totally messed up. AE goes on to say, that's why there's that weird you need under X or over Y line in the calculator. When we figured out what hype armor was actually doing and what the consequences were, everyone lost their minds. And that's not all, the hyper armor system is apparently running behind the scenes on some more attacks that aren't shown in the calculator. But the values are set so that nothing happens, and as AE describes it, it adds zero and resets to a minimum poise health of zero. In other words, there are some random attacks in the game with hyper armor turned on, but it's just not doing anything. Thankfully, I think this just applies to some attacks that you wouldn't expect to have hyper armor in the first place, so it's not exactly problematic, but it's another loose end that makes the system feel a bit strange behind the scenes. A also shared his general impression of the overall system, something I was curious to hear about from someone who dug so deeply into it. He said, Poise would be better off getting multiplied and divided during hyper armor instead of having something added and removed. And frankly, the values chosen for a lot of this are just bad. But he does reiterate that this is just his opinion, of course. This, to me, seems like it was an attempt at combining passive poise with Dark Souls 3's hyper armor system, but because they add and subtract poise when entering and exiting hyper armor, it causes problems. The penalty they included to give armor diminishing returns doesn't help, to put it mildly. And now for the most pertinent correction from the previous video, who really is the tankiest enemy in Elden Ring? We gave the trophy to Radon for having the highest poise value of 200. Now this is the highest value for an enemy that is directly set in the game, and another superlative does still belong to him. With the recovery time corresponding to that, we can still say that he has the longest and most forgiving timer of 15 seconds. He's still number one for that. But is he actually the tankiest? And the answer is no, because I missed out on some special effects that apply poise multipliers. Incoming poise damage is debuffed by some amount, and this was sort of applied to seven different enemies. Let's go through them. Special thanks to King Boar for dumping this list of enemies who have poise multipliers set in their special effects. To start with, three of those seven enemies are the giant octopus, giant lobster, and the golem. They have poise multipliers set in the data, but they don't seem to actually be applied and I couldn't find any body parts they might be specific to, so we can cross them off the list. Their effective poise is what we already know it to be, but it's interesting to look at these enemies and think about how the devs were experimenting with making it harder to break their stance. So that leaves just four enemies who actually have this working, three of whom are going to jump past Radon, bumping him down to fourth place. The real third place spot belongs to Lich Dragon Fortisax. The Lich Dragon starts with a default poise of 140, and it has a poise multiplier of 0.2. That makes it look like the effective poise should be five times higher than it is, only taking one fifth poise damage. Although the Lich Dragon also appears to take double poise damage after that. And to be perfectly honest, I have no idea what value is causing this or where that's set. This is all to say that the poise multiplier looks a little harsher than it really is. It's more like a 0.4 multiplier. For example, we can see that Flame of the Red Mains only does 40% of its normal poise damage, 16 instead of 40. This gives the Lich Dragon an effective poise of 350. Although his head does take double poise damage again, uh, so if you can land all headshots, it's like an effective poise of 175. In second place, we have the Knight's Cavalry. They also have a poise multiplier of 0.2, but this time that number works as expected making their 80 poise only one-fifth of what it really is effectively, which is 400. This applies to whether or not he's on horseback or foot, but when he is on foot, he'll get an instant poise refill the moment he resummons the horse, so that's something else to keep in mind. In first place, the true tankiest enemy is the ancient dragon found in Crumbling Ferum Azula. They also have a 0.2 multiplier, turning their 120 poise into an effective poise of 600. They also take double poise damage to their head, resulting in an effective poise of 300 if you can manage all headshots, which is still a lot higher than Verdon's 200 poise. I had several people asking why the Ancient Dragons seemed impossible to stance break, and here's our answer. It would take 8 casts of Flame of the Red Mains directly to their head to break their stance, and when we remember that the effective poise doesn't increase the recovery timer, 
that's only a little over 9 seconds between hits before their poise starts refilling, so you'd need to land those 8 hits very efficiently to avoid losing progress to that refill. Maybe you throw some daggers in between, I guess? I would love to see someone break their stance in New Game Plus 7. Good luck with that. So I did say that 4 enemies have their effective poise altered by poise multipliers, but we've already hit the new number 1 with just 3 enemies here. So who's the 4th enemy and what's going on there? The 4th enemy is the Abductor Virgin, and honestly I can't give a simple answer as to what their effective poise is. We might as well say it exists outside of space and time. So we're taking the most fucked up poise award away from the Crystallians and giving it here. What's happening is that they have a poise multiplier that's set to zero. It erases all incoming poise damage, so none of our normal poise damage matters. But this is only the first step. It then has another special effect that tells it to convert all incoming hits to cause a fixed amount of 5 poise damage. With 65 poise, you'd expect the math to work out so this would mean 13 hits of anything should break their poise. Uh, 13 times 5 equals 65 after all. But remember that earlier in the video, I talked about how they pretty consistently go to zero or negative poise without their stance actually breaking, so you need one additional hit afterwards. This is all to say that trying to come up with any kind of effective poise for the Abductor Virgins is meaningless. Instead we're switching over to a number of hit system, regardless of what you hit them with. So this requires 14 hits, maybe only 13 if you get extremely lucky with your timing. This means that knocking down the Abductors efficiently means getting as many hits in as quickly as possible. Doing big charged attacks isn't going to help, you'd still have to do 14 of those. This leads to some weird stuff like Night Maiden's Mist breaking their stance pretty effectively. It doesn't normally cause poise damage to other enemies, but every tick of damage from it removes 5 poise, and those ticks of damage happen fairly quickly. But there are even better options available because this isn't the whole story. The Abductor Virgins have yet another special effect that makes them take an additional 15 poise damage from any attack that has lightning damage. That 15 stacks with the original special effect that grants 5 poise damage, resulting in 20 poise lost per hit. Bearing in mind the negative poise situation, this means that 5 hits of anything with lightning will break their stance. So if for some reason you want to stunlock the Abductor Virgins, get them in a situation where they don't even have a chance to attack after getting back up, it becomes a question of how quickly you can perform lightning attacks. Buffing the spinning chain attack with lightning is one method that gets you there, providing a full stunlock situation for the Sawblade Abductors, but sometimes it can fall a little short for the Wheeled Abductors. The same goes for R1 spamming a two-handed lightning infused Cestus. Dual wielding lightning daggers and doing L1 spam might be the best option, fast enough to fully stunlock the wheeled abductors as well. If you're wondering about other lightning attacks, there are some spells that get multiple hits in, but overall they're not as effective as just pummeling them with lightning melee attacks. Thanks to everyone who commented on the last video, and if I didn't get to your question, don't be shy to remind me and ask again here. While I won't make another follow-up video for smaller questions about poise, I'll still try my best to answer questions in the comments, and I'll be using this video to start fresh for that. One bigger topic I know a lot of people wanted to know more about was what's going on with Torrent, and how leveling dexterity improves your ability to not get knocked off. But the tools I'd use to investigate that currently crash my game, uh, so I might have to save that one for later. If you enjoyed this video, please consider doing all the usual stuff that helps. You can also support me on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash illusorywall. An extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. Basileus, Gary Marshall, Kakaruma, Carl Germ, Kiko Abad, Chris, Lazy Tangent, Lude Frago, Nate Hines, Quinn Parsons, Ronax, The Majalis Duo, Torin, Zenatu, and Zelther. Thanks again for watching.